first I want to thank everybody that's here. I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. No, there's not that many people, so I could do that, but I won't. Um, what am I talking about here? What I'm really talking about here is what they were just finishing with, which is big data, yeah, 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 whatever, who cares? What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with this information? And I heard some very interesting things in that speaker's panel that sort of implied metadata, implied structure, implied content that may or may not be there. And there's always this sort of miracle happens here step that happens at the end where you assume that it all comes together and you assume that it all makes sense. And I'm going to try and unpack that assuming a little bit and say what do we really do as data, science, as data scientists, as people who have to deal with these overwhelming quantities of data to make sense of the questions that are being asked. So I'm really going to talk about three things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the questions that we ask. In this world where we can have it all, we can have it all now, and I can have a, an app or a thing, and I can walk around, and, and with that app or that thing, I can answer anything I want, that's great. What do you want? What questions are you going to ask? So you might remember all the stories when you were little. There's all these different fables about, all right, you get three wishes. You can't wish for more wishes. What are you going to wish for? And you start to think, well, I'll wish for world peace. Well, if I wish for world peace, then there's no war, and the world gets overwhelmed with people, and then we all die. All right, I'll wish for uh, an end to illness. Same thing. End to illness, too many people, not enough food, right? It starts to get very complicated when you can have it all. So what kind of questions do you ask in an environment where you can actually have it all? And then, speaking of having it all, there's these Vs that they talk about when we talk about big data. Volume, variety, veracity. What does that all mean? And who cares? And is it really just a bunch of words that sound good together, or is there some meaning behind that? And then the last thing is new opportunity and new risk. So if you get to ask the right question, and the data is there to ask that right question, what kind of things become possible that weren't possible just a few years ago? I'm going to try and get that all done in 22 minutes and 27 seconds. So here we go. The first thing is I want to just talk about the environment that we're in right now. So these are some uh-ohs that I want to try and call your attention to. First of all is we all get that the world is changing. That's why we're here in a warehouse that probably used to be used for some sort of mercantile activity, and now we're talking about data and API. and. Then, you know, there's something anachronistic about that, and it's somehow okay, right? We're all okay with that. But if you think about it really in terms of the rate of change of what's going on and what we tend to accept as normal, normal isn't normal anymore. The skills that made anybody successful to get to where they are today, and if you're in this room, by any definition around the world, you're successful. If you can afford to come here and spend some time and have a computer and a phone and a you're successful, right? Whatever skills made you successful, those aren't the skills that are needed going forward in this kind of a world. So this is kind of the wake up. And, and we're seeing all kinds of new data and technologies and things all the time, and to the point where we don't, even, we don't even think about it anymore. Things are changing faster, and the rate of the rate of change is changing faster. And finally, in this world where everything is changing, sky's the limit. It's up to you how much of that you can take advantage of. So, these are some, I don't know if you can see this or not with the lighting in the room, but these are some reports from Dun & Bradstreet from years ago, many, many years ago. So DMB is one of 11 companies in the United States that have been around for more than 150 years. Before 2008, there was 49. So that's pretty scary. They're dropping like flies. Hopefully not ours, but they're dropping like flies. And some of the things from our reports, purchaser of stolen goods, a great scoundrel, great scam. Uh, this, this, uh, this man is said to be in thriving circumstances. He's got a, a real and personal estate, and I think, he's, I think it, it's safe to trust him. So our reports used to be things like, you know, a great scamp, appears to be married to someone of wealth and consequence, um, office neat and tidy. You know, we don't have these kinds of things in our reports anymore, and if we did, we'd probably get sued. So the, the type of information that's being demanded is completely different. And yet, at the same time, if you think back to what does a predictive analytic really mean, it means, are these people that we want to do business with, are they likely to be around? When they say they're going to pay me, do they intend to pay me? If they didn't pay me, did they never intend to pay me, or did circumstances change? All of those things are embedded in this kind of feedback, but we can't do this kind of thing anymore. So 
what are the questions that we ask in an environment that's changing at the rate of the one we live in today? Let's start from the beginning. I have a quote here from the I Ching. I don't know if you can see it, but before the beginning of great brilliance, there must be chaos. We're certainly experiencing a lot of that chaos right now. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about chaos and data and asking the right question. If you know the answer, don't shout it out. If you do shout it out, no one will hear you anyway. So this is a story about fires. Does anybody in here know anything about fires? Like, have you been a fireman or been in a fire or anything like that? OK, I've got a couple hands. Thank you for the mercy hands. Uh, so this, this, this group of researchers was trying to study fire on Earth. And what they were trying to study, getting all the numbers out of this, was the fact that there's a lot of people that die from fires and get injured in fires every year. And is there anything we can do to impact that, to make that situation better? So that's a reasonable research question. It's a qualitative question. It contains the word better, right? It has quantitative content because we know how many people die now, and we can figure out if less people die later. So it's got the makings of some empirical research that could be reproduced by other people. So this particular group of researchers started looking at all the data that was available. And they found themselves in this data everywhere, were everywhere kind of an environment. The statistics are everywhere. If you start to look at this, you will find data and data and data about deaths by fire around the world. And very quickly, what starts to happen is you say, it's too big a question. I, I can't answer it. There's too many ways to die in a fire. And getting better at that, I don't know what it means. And I don't know whether the people got better because the medicine to deal with burns got better or the, the the things that prevented people from getting burned in the first place improved, it's, it's too complicated a question. So what this particular group of researchers did was they said, having more data is not the problem here. Having a better question is the problem. So they changed their question. And they said, instead of looking at why people die and how we can prevent people from dying, let's look at something smaller where we can understand the data better. And eventually, they got to this metric that was achievable, where they could get the data around the world. And it was deaths by fire per capita. And what they were trying to prove was that building codes that produced better buildings produced fewer deaths by fire per capita. So they turned it into this numerical question that they could answer. It's called making the data computational. So they did that. Guess what? Still too much data. Tons and tons of data. So they said, all right, we're going to make a, a grand simplifying assumption. Our grand simplifying assumption is going to be that every country's capital city is going to be one of its most densely populated cities. And if I just look at the data of deaths by fire per capita in all of the capital cities in the world, I'll get about 230 data points. And that feels like something I can understand. So that's called a grand simplifying assumption. They did that. They reduced all this data to deaths by fire per capita in the capital city of every country on Earth. And they were able to get the data. And they found the city with the smallest number of deaths by fire per capita. They still don't know why, but they found it. Guess what the city was? You're right. So you can't play, because you probably know why. <laughs> Anybody else? The man with the hat knows the answer. Did you say New York? You're wrong. He didn't say anything. Beijing? No, you're wrong. Boston? No, it's not a capital. Well, it's a city. Yeah, that's not even. The answer is, is actually not Sao Paulo, but you're on the right, right path. It's La Paz. And the reason it's La Paz is because La Paz is the highest altitude capital city in the world. And it turns out that it doesn't have anything to do with building codes or the, the way that the people behave when they're evacuating from a fire. It has to do with the presence of oxygen. Who knew? Oxygen, fuel, heat. We all learned this in like third grade, right? So the best way to reduce deaths by fire per capita is to have an environment that doesn't have as much oxygen. Now, of course, doing something with that data is another question. What do we do? Suck the oxygen out of the air? I don't think so. But the, the point is that even to understand this question required reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing the data, making this grand simplifying assumption, and then getting to that insight, that spark, and then what you do with it, that's a totally different question. So framing the question in the right context is an extremely important thing. Now, I'm coining a few terms here that you won't see anywhere. So you see the big 
the V's of big data, volume, variety, veracity. I have the big E's of asking a question. I just made this up, so it's not in a book anywhere. The first one is environment. You have to understand whether you're asking a question about the macro environment or the micro environment. Are you asking about how people evacuate buildings in a fire? Or are you asking about people dying? Or are you asking a question about fire? Those are very different questions. So the environment of the question, the environment surrounding the data that you're interested in, extremely important. The next E is enterprise. So at DMB, we primarily deal with businesses and the impact of their businesses. Are you talking about the fully deployed business and all of its linkage globally? Are you talking about a branch, a subsidiary? Are you talking about a person in the context of the business? Those are all very different questions. In order to understand the answer, I have to understand the question. The third E is exogeny. I apologize for the $97 word, but it had to start with an E. The idea behind exogeny is what's around the question? Why are you asking this? What's so important about the question? So if someone says to me, how many records do you have in your database in China? My answer shouldn't be 9,273,000, whatever the number is. My answer should be, why are you asking? What are you going to do with this answer? Well, I'm trying to understand the impact of shipping, the growth of the shipping industry on southeastern China. Oh, well, then you're really interested in how many businesses we have in southeastern China. Well, yeah, I said that. No, you didn't. Uh, okay, now, are you interested in consulting firms and law firms and plumbers in Southeast China? Well, no, I'm interested in people that ship things. Oh, okay. So understanding more about the question before I answer it, extremely important. And the last E is expression. How am I going to give you the answer back? Are you asking me for a score, a product, a package, a service? There's a very different answer depending on what kind of a response you want in terms of the expression of the answer. So those are the four E's of asking the right question. Now, once we get to the right question, we have to also think about how the data evolves in answering that question. So there's three big stages of evolution of the data. There's the first, the presentation of the data. What do you have? What's discoverable? What can I go out and find? What can I compute? All of that is in this big data blob that you have. And then the second thing is the ideation. How am I going to make these, sum these assumptions different? How am I going to ask the right questions? How am I going to simplify the problem to get it down to something that's actually solvable? And then the last thing is the execution. What am I going to do with the answer to make it meaningful to you? So the big takeaways here are the difference between the articulated want and the discoverable need, really, really important. Second thing is the epistemological frame. What, what do you believe when you're asking this question? If you are asking me that question about the businesses in China, you believe that by knowing something about the growing number of businesses, you'll know something about the growing business volume. That implies certain things that may or may not be true, because more businesses can consume more things, or the same number of businesses can consume more, right? And then, of course, there's the unknown needs that you're already meeting, right? So people are already using your data, your product, your service, in ways that you don't necessarily understand. So you start answering their question, you drive them into a different place, that place may be worse for them in terms of actually using the data that you're giving them. And then finally, what I've been calling this grand simplifying assumption, the aha, the thing that you do that actually reduces it to something usable. So these Vs that I keep talking about, volume, variety, velocity, veracity, these are the things that are your, kind of your friend or your enemy, depending on how you deal with the amount of data in your hands. When you have a lot of data, so here's a good example. I don't know if you can see anything in this picture, but imagine you could, and look really hard at this. What you see here is the benediction of Pope Paul in 2005. I'm sorry, uh, the benediction of Pope Benedict, um, which is hard to say, in 2005. This is in the indoor part of St. Peter's in the Vatican. And you see a whole bunch of people there, right? What else do you see? Do you see anything about the crowd? One person with a little flip phone taking a picture, right? Is that what you said? Excellent, thank you. Imagine I could hear you and you could hear me, right? So right here, there's a person taking a picture with a phone. And this person is looking back at the camera. And you have some religious people here. There's some security people trying to not look like security people, right? What happens with an event like this? In 2005, not that long ago, most of the data about this event was created before the event. 
the stream, the bubble of data about this event preceded the event. And maybe after the event, some people wrote about it, but certainly during the event, there wasn't a lot other than the news coverage. Fast forward just a few years to the most recent papal appointment, and now, instead of a picture being worth a thousand words, you have a thousand pictures being taken in the time it takes to speak a single word. Oh my gosh. What does that mean in terms of the availability of data? The data about this event is being created before, during, and after the event. It's being constantly synthesized. Every single person in that room is carrying some sort of an electronic device that's creating a trail of data. There's near field communication. These devices are communicating with each other. They're creating their own data as they talk to each other. And all of that's happening in real time. Now, if you think that the kind of questions that this is as close as you're going to get to a controlled social experiment, it's the same event, it's the same kind of people that tend to go, they tend to be there for the same reason, it's as close as you're going to get. And it couldn't possibly be more different eight years difference. That's the rate of acceleration, of change around the data environment. This is a, a fantastic example of why we need to ask different questions and use different techniques to answer those questions just to stay up to where we were before, just to survive in this kind of an environment. So this is my nightmare slide. These are three examples from DMB world of things that keep me up at night. This is a company called Box Park. Anybody know Box Park? It's in London. Uh, where is it in London, you ask? Well, anywhere it wants to be, because if you look closely at this business, it's made up of shipping containers. And you can ship it anywhere you want, and you can call it anything you want. It's a pop-up mall. So you can have the Hello Kitty mall, and the Surfer Dude mall, and the Christmas tree shop, and it can all be the same enterprise in three different places with three different names, three different addresses at different times of the year. Guess what we use to understand the identity of a business? The name and the address of the business. Well, if the name is fungible and the address is fungible, what's a business? <laughs> this is a major problem. Here's another problem. This is a sign, and if you could read the sign, does anybody here speak Chinese or Japanese? If you can read, keep me honest, if you can read the sign in the top, it says something like the woods ahead are dangerous, they contain danger, something like that. The sign is then transliterated and translated into Korean script, into simplified and traditional Chinese, into various different writing systems, and each time it looks like the sign maker transliterated the, the line above. And by the time you get down to the bottom, what the sign says is, this sign is here to prevent foreign tourists from getting lost. Not even close to what the top says. This is happening in our data. There is more data being created in multilingual format, in other words, not in a common language, than there is in one format right now. There is far more data being created not in English than in English, for example. And so if you think you're going to do research and exclude all the data that's not in your language, think again. And if you think you're going to translate your way out of the problem, think again, because that's not going to work either. Because every time you translate, you lose meaning. So that's another nightmare to worry about. And the third one is this, this is a picture which I believe is completely unreadable from the audience, but this is a bag from an uh, electronic shopping mall. And what you could see is a bunch of brands here. And so there's NEC, and there's Mitsubishi, and there's names that are written in different languages and different scripts, and they're all kind of mashed together. And your brain sees that, and it fixes it automatically. Well, this is unstructured data. Now, what can I infer from this? Well, they're all in the same bag, so they're competing with each other. The bag came from an electronics mall, so the metadata tells me that these companies deal in electronics. Some of them have represented their names only in Asian script. That tells me maybe they're more interested in dealing with the Asian consumer than they are with the sort of the international consumer, and so on and so on and so on. So imagine a block of data now that does the same thing, and what we're asked to do is to unpack it and figure out what it means. That's another big nightmare. So these are the three big ones that are kind of keeping me awake at night. Um, you see here a picture of a mail room and a bunch of sacks of mail. And if you could look closely at the little pictures of what's in those little buckets of mail, they're cards. These are, this is the way DMB used to collect data about businesses in the, I think in the early 1900s. The question really hasn't changed all that much. Who is this company and should I do business with them? The problem is that the crowd has gotten way bigger. So trying to understand 
the context of that question in this bigger crowd is a very different problem. You see me right now, you know what I look like. If there was a fire drill and we all walked out by the wharf, you could find me. Even if there's a few hundred people or a few thousand people there, you could find me. Imagine if there was a few million people, not so much, right? So the problem gets very different when the size of the crowd and the amount of noise changes. And of course, as the rate of change changes, the types of ways that you deal with that problem have to change as well. There's a quote here, um, I won't read it, but basically what it's saying is that by 2018, we're not gonna have enough data scientists. The hot, sexy skill that, that's gonna be in, in the most demand is gonna be data scientist. So, you know, if you believe this, then you believe that geeks will inherit the earth. I don't know if I believe it or not, but it's sort of data about data, it's interesting. I would say that that day is almost here already. Um, so now we're in the home stretch. New risk, new opportunity. Um, these are some different ways that you might find DMB represented around the world. You can see it in Asian script, in Chinese. So in, in Chinese, what it says is Dengbaishu, which is like the sound of DMB. What it says in Japanese is Donando Bradstrito. It's written in like phonetic Japanese. And then you see uh, one of our partners. These are all different ways we go to market. Mashing all that together and realizing that all of those things are talking about the same company is a massively non-trivial problem. Now multiply it by all the other companies that go by D&B. So there's a carpentry firm and an audio firm and a whole bunch of other firms. None of those are D&B and they're all called D&B. One of those people is a guy whose initials happen to be D and B and he goes by D&B Carpentry. So being able to disconnect all of those, you can't just do it by the name, you can't just do it by the metadata, you can't do it by the context, you gotta kinda do it by all of that. There's also a place called DMB where you can go for drinks if this gets too much for you, but I won't get into that right now. Um, so given that we have all this data and we understand all these challenges, the most critical thing becomes situational awareness in the data. Imagine that you could sort of step into the data and walk around it. What kinds of questions would you ask? So there's an example up here, and this is a real example with the names changed. One of our customers came to us it was an insurance application. They had some issue with uh, resolution of the data. And eventually it turns out that what they had was a linkage problem because this particular company had 49% ownership, so non-majority ownership of itself by another company that significantly complicated the risk profile of this particular potential client. And as we started to unpack this in the data and understand the nature of the question they were asking, it turns out that there was also a very large piece of ownership to this very large company, which was thousands of times bigger, also minority interest. Why would a very large company make a minority interest investment in a very small company? Turns out they have a very specialized product. They're the only customer. There's three old guys that own this company, and the deal is they made an equity investment so they would keep the business open, and when they retire, the controlling interest goes to the big company, not the small company. So if you get in bed with this company, you're not getting in bed with them, you're getting in bed with that really big company, who, by the way, had a half a billion dollar lawsuit at the time. So being able to get situational awareness in your data is critical. In this particular example, you think you're dealing with Citgo, you're looking, you're following yourself up the family tree of Citgo, and eventually you get to PDV America, which gets you to a company in the Netherlands, and eventually to the government of Venezuela, as you would expect, or maybe not so much. So being able to get that situational awareness in the data and ask a question that leads you there is where it's all at. Now, I have some examples here that you won't really be able to see, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them, but. These are some other examples where language plays into it. So um, we're looking at Kawasaki here. Kawasaki is a region in Japan. It also means something. It, it means basically beside the mountainous terrain. And so if you have a business, is it named after the business, the terrain, the region, or is it part of the motorcycle company? Very difficult question to answer. Um, we, I heard some conversation in the last panel discussion about people in the context of business. So the big questions you want to ask about people. There's businesses that are named after people. You can see here Ann Taylor. There's no person named Ann Taylor. It's a fictitious person. But I'll bet you there's a woman named Ann Taylor. And the data about that woman is not the data about this business. So if you're connecting all your data by finding names that are similar, you're not matching data about people. You're matching data about names. And that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. So we're using much more complex solutions to deal with that kind of a problem. 
uh, people with the same name, people with more than one name, all different types of issues that you have when you start talking about people. And the majority of solutions right now are focused on finding names that are the same, which is leaving about 50% to 80% of the opportunity on the table. So we're, we're looking at that in a much more complex way, using big data, asking different questions, grand simplifying assumptions. We're also using those assumptions to drive more careful treatment of things like fraud and malfeasance. So you see an example here where we find one, we, we use the term malfeasant because I can't tell you that it, they've committed fraud because they haven't actually defrauded me. And if I say they've committed fraud, then it causes all kinds of issues. So this particular individual who's engaged in this highly risky behavior has moved from one company to another and started a series of companies pretty much as we caught him doing one thing and, or another. And if we can follow the individual based on the confluence of information about the individual and not just their name, we can actually connect all of these enterprises. That's a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. A few years ago, that would be impossible because the data trail wouldn't be there. Now data isn't the problem anymore. It's the correct technology to connect all of that. This looks like a picture of very large camels walking in the desert. Actually, the camels are these little white things on the ground. And the black things are the shadows of the cam camels. This was taken from an airplane. It's a phenomenal picture. I wish you could see it. Um, the idea here is to find the camels, not the shadows of the camels. So we had a situation in Japan when the earthquake and the tidal wave and the tsunami and the nuclear meltdowns were happening. We were looking at data. We had the, the, the geospatial data, the satellite imagery. We built algorithms to find the skyline and measure the area under the skyline before and after the earthquake and compare it to the mass of a building. We built algorithms to detect cars based on the reflectivity of the windshield versus the top of the car and the front of the car. And then we could count the cars and we could measure the roads. And we built algorithms that could look at the infrastructure, like the crowdsourced radiation data that was available, the flooding data, the topographical information to figure out whether a business may or may not have gotten wet. You munge all that together into an algorithm and you teach the algorithm how to detect whether or not the business is likely to still be in business. Now that might feel like a commercial thing to do, but it's also a life-saving thing to do because people were assuming everyone was out of business and some people weren't and they were living hand to mouth. So by helping them be visible, actually help them stay in business and help them deal with a situation where 20,000 people just got washed out to sea. So there's a very real human dimension to this as well. And, and that's all a part of this. This isn't all about having some commercial answer to everything. So this one was uh, more than a, a simple task, to say the least. Um, this last one I'm going to show you here is connecting data about all the connections that we can possibly understand in a business. And if you're this business here, you obviously know about these two big counterparties that you have. But what you really can't see is there's a cluster of counterparties that enable those two people, those two businesses that you're very dependent on, if something happens over here and these guys get the flu, your entire supply chain collapses. So looking at the customers of your customers and the vendors of your vendors and the customers of your vendors' customers, that sort of dyadic relationship expanded into this massive polyhedron that you walk around with an algorithm in some sort of a quantum way. Yeah, you got to do all that. It's that hard. But the data is there and we can do all that and that's the good news. So the mousetrap, we can invent a better mousetrap, but the mouse or, mice are getting smarter at the same time. And so it's very important to remember that as we're solving these very complex problems, new, more complex problems are being created. The bad guys are getting smarter. The shipping companies are shipping faster. Everybody wants everything now. So the environment is changing at the same time. So don't congratulate yourself when you get good at problem formulation. You have to stay up with the, the rate of change, the pace of change here. I'm going to leave you with a couple of big insights. I know you can't read them all, so I'm going to tell you my favorite ones on here. Just because something's on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. Just because you collected a piece of information a second ago doesn't mean that piece of information is a second old. Correlation doesn't mean causation. Just because things are connected to each other in some sort of an equation doesn't mean one is causing the other. Repetition does not necessarily mean truth. Repetition does not necessarily mean truth. Repetition, sorry. Um, latency, everything has latency. There's no such thing as real time. It is impossible to have a real time application. And if you could, 
why would you be asking a better question? Not necessarily true. Do you want somebody's blood pressure every three seconds? I don't think so. Sometimes it's not about having more. Well, you can't see the picture, but it's the Swiss Army knife with a hundred different blades on it. Who wants to try and screw in a screw with that? It's just way too much. So this environment, this culture of I want more, I want a bigger hard drive. No, you don't. You want the right data, and you need to be able to sense that data. Here's a picture of a car going off a cliff, and the GPS is saying recalculating. Right? The problem there is not more data. The problem there is situational awareness before you drive through the fence. So we're doing this with our data right now. We're forcing data scientists to go ask questions about much larger data sets without necessarily understanding what we're going to do with those answers. And just taking a neural network and telling it to go look at a bunch of data without understanding the question can sometimes be interesting, but very often can lead you into a very dangerous direction. So here we sit. We sit at the beginning of a very beautiful time. Anybody here who is old enough to have another 10 years or so in front of you working, you're living in the most glorious time I can possibly imagine. The change is happening so fast that all you have to do is go and take it. And all you have to do if you want to get killed by it is ignore it for a couple seconds. So that's all I have for you. If you have any quick questions, I can answer them or I'm happy to talk to you in the back of the room. I know we're pressed for time. Thank you.